what is it about being out in the back country, you know, kind of stalking an animal? What about it do you think is creates that that immediate addiction? You're at 10,000 feet. You have inclement weather. Everything is on your back that you're going to survive on. And you're out there on their field. That is literally the ultimate test. It is my version of the CrossFit Games. I'm training for my version of the Super Bowl. And mine starts in September. You're listening to the Born Primitive Podcast. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Born Print Podcast. How we doing, Tone? Doing good. Did you get your pump in this morning? Got it in. There, boy. All right. Hey, so this morning, uh, we got Dan Staten. Um, Dan is a, is a longtime CrossFit dork, just like me, um, and an avid Western hunter. Um, he holds a uh, master's in exercise physiology. Um, and what we're really going to get into, Dan is the founder of Elk Shape, and, and that's an online platform um, that kind of gives online programming for people, you know, that are trying to get physically prepared for hunting in the back country. Additionally, there's gear guides, articles, blogs, the whole deal. Uh, he also hosts the Elk Shape podcast and is the founding member of the Elk Shape Collective. And uh, most recently, uh, they've added Elk Shape camps. So, um, you know, Dan is a diehard, you know, Western and elk hunter and has um, created a business around his lifestyle and his pursuit of fitness. And for those that have dabbled in Western hunting, know that that fitness um, is a huge component of, of that. Um, so really cool. You know, Dan, uh, welcome to the Born Primitive podcast. We're really excited to kind of hear your story, man. Hey, it's an honor to be here. been looking forward to this all week. So let's go kind of back, not all the way to the beginning, but but obviously, you know, you like me and Tony are, are have been gym rats for a long time. And, you know, fitness has been a big part of our life. And I know you grew up hunting with your old man. Um, so I guess walk us through um how Elk Shape was born, um, because you know it's we love hearing you know other entrepreneurs' success stories. Particularly, what's unique about yours is it's it seemed like it stemmed from you know that was just something you were naturally passionate about, and you're able to kind of harness a passion and put it into a real business. So, walk us through how it all got started, your background in that, um, and uh, you know get us to, to current day. Well, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version, fellas. Um, was on that pathway to. I just wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach for NFL, really not NHL, not major league baseball, not hockey, but just professional football. I just thought I would, that would be a good fit for me. So that's my pathway kind of grew up being a personal trainer. That's kind of how I paid for tuition. And uh, then I managed gyms. And then when I got into my graduate work, I started interning, and I worked at uh, Athletes Performance as an intern. This was 2006. So this was like Athletes Performance was the pinnacle. That's where everybody went to right prior to the NFL Combine. That's where they would go to basically study for the, the test, if you will. So I learned their best practices. And then um, somehow right around that time, I had experienced my first true elk hunt at age 21, I went rifle elk hunting with my dad kind of on a whim and I had success. We went into the back country public land in Washington state and I killed a bull and I just, it kind of changed my trajectory. Meaning this was a 700 pound animal that we had to break down and pack out of the mountains. And uh, I remember kind of looking into elk hunting and finding out that you could hunt them with archery, like with a bow and arrow and that they bugled and they had like this dinosaur roar that was reserved for September. And most of the States out West had elk, but they would only let you hunt them during the rut when they're screaming with a bow. So I went and bought a bow and I would say fast forward. I'm all or none personality my dreams of becoming an NFL strength coach quickly died. And I had this birth of, I want to elk hunt every day in September. And how do I do that? And so fast forward, I've been elk hunting for 24 years. I squashed my dreams of being an NFL strength coach. I did get the graduate degree in exercise phys and opened up my own gym. Somewhere along the lines found CrossFit. And then I kind of carved out my own pathway and was like, after a few years of elk hunting, I realized how daunting it was physically and mentally that I started writing programs to help prepare for elk hunting. 
and getting into elk shape. So in 2013, we started or founded elk shape. Well, that's fascinating, man. And it's <laughs> like, so what, my next question, it's funny. So I, full disclosure, I have never been hunting. Um, you know, I was a military guy. I definitely know my way around a rifle. Um, that part's good to go. Um, but me growing up, I was always doing, you know, sports and school. Like I just, I never, it never was a thing. Hunting was big in Indiana, but obviously it's way different. Um, so I'm trying to get out there this year with Aaron, um, and, and Viking armament built us a badass rifle and night force gave us the optic. Like it's a, it's a badass, uh, gun. And obviously Aaron is one of the best in the business. And I'm, so I'm sure he's going to spoil me and my, that being my first experience, but every guy that I've talked to, and it's literally 100% has said the same thing. When, when you do your first elk hunt, it, it changes you and you're, you're essentially immediately addicted. Like it's, it's like a hundred percent success rate. So for the viewers that have never hunted, you know, particularly also like the ladies too, that maybe don't understand it. And I, and I don't understand it yet. Right. So I'll, I'll put myself in that category. What is it about being out in the back country, you know, kind of stalking an animal and then, you know, ultimately killing it and pulling it out of the field and eating it and all that? Like, what about it do you think is creates that, that immediate addiction? Um, and then second part of the question is for the people that aren't avid hunters, can you kind of frame up how different Western hunting is from like traditional tree stand hunting. Cause that's like what, you know, my buddies did growing up in Indiana. Right. And now that I'm exposed to Western hunting, which wh that's why I think it is such a good fit for our brand the born for born print of outdoor, because there's such a physical component to it. Right. Um, and, 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 and that's exactly what is, you know, led to the development of, of your brand too. So two part question kind of loaded, but, uh, what do you got? All right. Uh, well, I think we all can understand for the most part, what an eight ounce prime cut steak tastes like. But what not everybody understands is when you are involved in the entire process from field to table, you know it's sourced. You know where that animal lived, what it ate, and what was not injected into it. No hormones, not immunized. It was free range, living its best life. And its only job is to survive. Uh, so you've got to flip the script. You're going to their home field advantage. My refrigerator is literally 10 feet away. I got running water. I got a thermostat at 70. Like comfort, you want to talk about comfort? It's here. It's at your guys' house. So 180 that, go set, go step foot into their backcountry, their home turf, match wits and try to get within archie range and get one killed it's it's difficult in fact it took me five seasons of failure and it wasn't for a lack of time i mean i would literally take the entire month to try to get an elk with a bow and i failed miserably and it, it honestly it, it was the best thing that could ever happen to me to to experience that failure because every year i would go back to the drawing board and try to uncover what am I missing? What can I do better? Is it archery? Is it fitness? Is it mental? Is it woodsmanship? Is it, you know, and so it, it just, this, I became obsessed. And now it is, um, I've had a lot of consistent success, obviously, but it still feels like it's impossible opening day year over year. I step out of my truck at a trailhead on public land. You got a swath of mountains and trees and, and you're supposed to go find an elk and try to get close, get it killed, get it cut up, get it butchered, bring it back to your truck, take it home, process it and put it in your freezer. Um, so I just, every ounce of elk meat that goes in my body, not only is my version of PEDs, I do think elk meat is like the greatest PED. It is so rewarding to know that I earned it. And there is a degree, like there's a dichotomy there of like, I celebrate when I get an elk, but there's also like this remorse or respect that is hard to describe and hard for folks to understand that don't hunt where you're pumped that you just killed this animal. Well, yes, because it's going to feed the family and it was such a rewarding experience and it was a culmination of 335 days of work so I could hunt for 30 days. But uh, yeah, I'm sad that this beast was taken down. And so that's what Western hunting is, man. Like you're, you're at 10,000 feet. You have inclement weather. Everything is on your back that you're going to survive on. And you're out there on their field. 
I, I don't know if I'm doing a good job, but man, like that is literally the ultimate test. It is my version of the CrossFit games. I'm training for my version of the Super Bowl, and mine starts in September. And Dan, and those, and this is coming from a personal angle too, because I grew up a little different than Bear in the sense that like I grew up hunting from the age of five, but it was in Pennsylvania. So just a different dynamic. But of course, you're hunting different animals. You're not just tree hunting, but. I have similar to bear, just like it, it's going to happen either this year or next year where I, I get out West. So the question I'd like to ask you is in those five years, in those five years that you didn't get anything, what did you find? Like, cause I know you mentioned, like you were kind of questioning, is this physical? Is this, uh, kind of my preparation? Like, is this just a field tactic thing where I'm, I'm not, I'm not putting myself in the right position. What did you find in those five years? Where did you need to lean more into, uh, to kind of get, uh, adapted to that style of hunting? Yeah, so I want to say I, I I changed the way I trained and ate. I got archery lessons and all that stuff. No, I learned, I made every mistake that you could possibly make when it comes to closing the deal on getting a shot opportunity and making the most of it. And I learned how to move through the mountains and navigate country. Uh, that is probably what prevented me from getting an elk was not understanding the animal, their behavior, their biology, and what they were looking for to make a living in the mountains. I was pretty just honestly new to the whole thing and pretty oblivious. So just field craft and understanding how animals use mountains to make their living. On the fitness side of things, I was kind of a beefcake when I started. I probably weighed 30 more pounds than I do now. It was a little too bulky for uh, the power lifting and the bodybuilding really wasn't transferring over to what I needed as far as the endurance, like the general physical preparedness. Uh, and then obviously the archery is something that you can forever get better at, like you've never mastered it. And so just kind of getting some actual archery instruction kind of, I, I, to your audience, they might get this analogy. I feel like I taught myself how to snatch or clean without a coach. And so for five years, I was kind of like wired wrong. And I had to like start over and undo these bad habits and, and learn the fundamentals of archery. And that, those three steps really kind of built me up to where I started getting success. Yeah. And I think I want to just call out something you said that I think is so important. And this is anyone, somebody asked back home about hunting or just knowing that I grew up hunting the, the whole kind of reverence for the animal that you called out is so important because I could see how, if you've never been exposed to that, you've never killed an animal. It seems vicious. And it seems like, oh, you're just doing this for, for sport. When, like you said, Dan, I felt the exact opposite. Some of the most connected moments, it's like a mix of like you said, extreme excitement mixed with this like deep sadness and reverence for the animal you just killed. And to me, like that, that is kind of hardwired into our DNA. And when you experience that, it, it kind of humbles you and it makes you appreciate not only what your ancestors have been doing for thousands of years, but then also, as you said, like the sacrifice of the animal that you're now going to be putting in your body and your family's body. So I just wanted to call that out because I couldn't agree with more. And I think that is a huge misconception just in the hunting world in general, that these are just like vicious hillbillies out to kill animals. It's like, it, it's, it's so different than that. And like, when you're exposed to it, you build a respect for what it actually plays out, plays out like, and looks like in the field. Yeah. The reverence is definitely, that's the word of choice. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I knew we probably would get into this, but like, I'm an old school CrossFitter. I think I started doing CrossFit in 2006 and seven. I was a huge critic of CrossFit and then I tried it. And then that's all she wrote. I, I still have a lot of love and respect for old CrossFit and even Greg Glassman. And he used to like, say, you know, say in his lectures, like man did not invent the deadlift. Like it's organic. It's found in nature. And, and I would even say that we didn't invent hunting. Like it is just something we had to do to be alive and thrive. It's definitely deeply embedded in our DNA. And so I'm just speaking to your audience that maybe has a tough time getting their mind wrapped around it. It is definitely something that I feel that is inherently part of us, whether we like it or not. And when you, whether you choose to eat meat or not, I don't want to rail, derail this conversation. I just think we have to agree that there is death involved in everything. Whatever type of food you choose to consume, 
there, there's death involved and it's part of life and it, we can celebrate that in a, in a positive light and that it's sustenance and it helps us. And so, yeah, man, when you're getting food from the mountains and an animal's life's taken, it's not complete glory. There's a deep, deep gratitude and reverence is the most appropriate word. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah, and I think for me, that another cool thing I've kind of learned just being around, you know, you all and being exposed to, to the hunting crowd is these people have probably, the, you know, uh, they have a huge emphasis on on conservation efforts, too, uh, yes. which I think that's another misconception. Now, you put it well, like, oh, these are just vicious hillbillies that, you know what I mean? And I'm a hillbilly. Yeah, record, yeah, right. I exactly. Am, I'm a pure hillbilly. And I'm from Indiana, too. <laughs> yeah. So I get that. Um, but now once you, you know, see that how important you know, wildlife conservation is to, you know, to sustain hunting. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, I think people can might stereotype that, you know, environmentalism or anything is like this, you know, fringe thing. And it's like, no, this is actually a kind of a, something that all occur, anyone from both sides of the aisle can get on board with, but it, particularly in the hunting scene, it's, ex, it's extremely, um, you know, significant part of, of that scene. And, you know, in fact that we're, you know, we'll be by the time this records, this will be done, but I, I, I don't, Dan, I don't know if you're tracking, but we are, um, at the Western hunt, um, expo at the, at the fundraiser on Friday night. Um, we are, we are, um, auctioning off a skydive elk hunt experience. Um, and it's going to be wild. Um, I mean, I think this thing is going to absolutely go off. I think the governor is going to get up there and talk about it. And we made a highlight video and, and while the, while dad hunts, the family's going to be on the ranch and we're going to entertain the kids and take them shooting and ATV riding and, you know, just all that kind of stuff. Um, but half of the proceeds are going to go to wildlife conservation and the other half are going to go to veteran charity. So like, um, but that whole point of that banquet is wildlife conservation, right? There's 2,500 people there and it's all about Western hunting. Um, but there's such an effort towards that. So that's, I think another, another really cool part of this that I didn't necessarily know, but I think is a big misconception along with kind of what you talked about with, oh, these are just, they just have bloodlust. It's like, it's actually the exact opposite. And it's cool to see the reverence because it is a somber moment you know what i mean i totally get you know what you guys getting at so um but uh but obviously you got to maintain you know the, the 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 environment to have a conditions for big elk right so it's everyone wins and um so yeah yeah and that's i mean those ta- and dan would know 100x more about <clears throat> this than i would but like the tag numbers they're issuing those aren't they don't just pull that out of a hat like there is there is a very like they they know the population of certain areas and they're issuing tags based off that in in every part of the u.s so that yeah the 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 misconception too that you can just go go buy three three white-tailed uh deer tags in pennsylvania and just kill it's like it's not like that and it it ebbs and flows some years there's more access to tags than others but yeah that that is a big misconception that that you can just ruth like go kill six elk if you want it doesn't work that way yeah that i want to get your opinion on this dan and, and maybe this is like a maybe a polarizing question but i you know you hit the nail on the head. There's people way smarter than us that are the actual scientists that are helping issue like the amount of tags every year to keep the environment in balance and all this. And I think that's great, but it's interesting now, you know, you take the thing like in Colorado, right? Where they like, it was like a public vote to like release a bunch of wolves into, into you know what I mean? And, and, you know, I, I'm not super savvy on this, but I think I have the cliff notes, but I believe it was a public vote, right? Do you want wolves or do you not want wolves? And a bunch of people that don't know anything about the environment are voting, oh, wolves, yeah, they're like, of course we want wolves, like release the wolves, right? And scientists are saying there are things that could happen that, that could destroy the, you know, the wildlife, right, for a variety. I mean, you'll have now packs of wolves running around and ripping fetuses out of a pregnant elk, right? Um, so... I, again, I am not an expert on this. I just know, I, I thought it was very interesting that something that is so scientific and biological that people with PhDs should be deciding on, they're now making it uh, like the public has a say. Like, I, of course, I'm for voting. Like, you know, you should be able to pick your presidential candidate in Congress and all this. But for something that uh, nuanced that requires uh, your background knowledge, in my opinion, the public shouldn't have a say in that, right? Because the scientists, they, you know, they went to school for this for 10 years, right? So, you know, Dan, maybe I'm way off, but is that, you know, am I in the arena? Um, and, and do you think the the wolves presents a huge risk? And I know that's Colorado, so that's not your backyard, but I, I don't know if you had a, a stance on this one. Ooh, um, I'm going to tread lightly, but... Okay. So I live in uh, Washington State, we have wolves. We've uh, we don't we don't manage them. And when I say manage them, there is no hunting of wolves allowed. So when you have wolf conflict with you know cattle ranchers who make their living, 
um, a lot of times they're they're handcuffed and there's not a lot of situations where they can defend their cattle without getting in touch with fishing game and then Washington State spends money to have professional contract people come out and a lot most of the wolves that have been killed in my state have been by fishing game and these wolves are just kind of doing what wolves do man like they just kill stuff that's what they do um and they're on the landscape and we can't manage them my neighbor idaho has wolves they have they let you know we, they don't even know how many wolves are there they're in the thousands in idaho which is way above objective which is way above what idaho agreed to with the federal government back in uh probably 96 clinton administration but uh they have management they have a gracious wolf season it's almost year round you can get you can legally harvest multiple wolves trapping all the all sorts of it doesn't matter there's the wolves are still there they're very prevalent and that's a state that you can that they are trying to manage them but they're still doing so well because wolves are amazing um but when you look at colorado and, and what we call ballot box wildlife management which is something that i'm strongly against where you're like hey everybody in colorado what do you think about having wolves and the majority of the people live in denver and boulder and they're like yeah that sounds cool i mean it does on exactly paper. and i thought the same thing well, yeah 90 percent of colorado is rural and they all voted no because they were like uh that's gonna implicate uh, implicate how i make a living I really don't want wolves on the landscape. We already have a few here already, which is true. You can fact check me. They've already had incidences of wolves that are collared leaving Wyoming for Colorado. So they're already there and they're going to continue to grow. All these rural ranching communities voted no, but you know what? It's just like electoral college. Your vote doesn't really count when you're not the majority. And the majority of the people will never see wolves because they live in metropolitan areas, i.e. Denver, Boulder. So no, I don't like ballot box management. I like scientists, biologists, the people that my hunting license funds, like I help pay for their salary. They are saying we don't need that, but when you leave it up to the public that are probably just indifferent and uninitiated. I don't want to say uneducated, but really it is like they don't have a true understanding of what the implications are. I would vote yes if I didn't know. Like, yeah, wolves are cool. And it's just going to be very detrimental. Colorado has the most elk out of any state out west. And that's going to change. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Um I wish, I mean, I don't know how that became a thing where the people could weigh in on something so scientific, but, you know, maybe it'll take a few years for them to realize what they did and then maybe they can allow, you know, take take away the, the handcuffs to be able to, I guess, get that population back in control. But I, I'll be, you know, curious to see how it plays out with the elk population and what, what else that does to the environment there. Um, well, Dan, I yeah, want to rewind a little bit to something that you're kind of seeing, and I'm, I, I think it's cool as somebody, as I mentioned before, who grew up hunting, is that there's this, there is a resurgence, especially within the Western hunting realm, it seems like, like a, a resurgence of interest in getting out West to, to go on potentially, even for myself or Bear, like your first hunt. So the question I would ask you is for, an, for individuals that maybe it's just a thought in their mind. And, and of course, I think Joe Rogan, yourself, all these names who have helped spread the word on, on Western hunting, I think have, have, have dwelled up this, this interest in people. But if somebody, let's say somebody from, Let's say somebody from Virginia, where we're at now, who's never been out west on a hunt, calls you and says, hey, Dan, I'm interested in going out west on a hunt. What type of plan should I lay out both physically, mentally, and then just the, like you said, learning, uh, understanding how to navigate the land out there? How would you kind of walk through and, and give advice to somebody who's interested, but is kind of at point zero and has no clue where to start uh, as far as getting out there? Oh. Yeah, we can do a whole podcast on that. <laughs> it's a loaded question for sure. That's so let's say you live in, you know, you're coming out west. That's exciting. That's a dream for a lot of people just to just to get the chance to go out west. And they're right. It's it's gonna be an incredible experience. And I think you'd have to take a step back and define what what a successful trip would look like for you before you even step foot on your journey of preparation. Like uh just getting an elk is not gonna be a good way to define a successful trip. You, you probably won't get one. Um, it's going to be hard. Like the odds are that 
that only five to ten percent of actual hunters actually harvest. So if you can Damn. quickly take a step back and say, you know, I'm just going to get experience. This is a long term play. I, I plan on going back. If I love it, I'm going to go back year over year and, and start the journey. Just like you, you wouldn't sign up for the CrossFit Games. Like you could do that the very first year and that's it. Now there's several steps to get to it. There's going to be a lot of steps to have success at elk hunting. Um, the first thing you might want to look at is what kind of experience do you want to have as far as do you want to do it yourself? Like unguided, no help. You don't want to hire an outfitter. You just want to do it yourself. Um, okay, that's going to get – the task is going to get taller. So if you have the means, you might want to like do some research, do some phone call research and figure out where what state do I want to go and, and who do I want to hire? And, and that's a good way to go. And I, and I definitely would applaud anyone who has the means and, and the humility to hire help, essentially get a coach and, and go experience a five or 10 day hunt in Montana or in Colorado. But for those do-it-yourselfers, do um, you got a tall order. You, you're going to have to first research how to get an elk tag. They don't grow on trees. And uh, yeah, it is a limited thing. So there's a lot of competition um there's only a set amount uh, each year for residents and non-residents to to get an elk tag so secure an elk tag make sure that you are physically in shape to hump the mountains with a ruck on your back at all times learn your weapon whether it be a rifle muzzleloader archery um, become one with it um I'm sure bear you can appreciate that regardless of the weapon knowing the ins and outs and understanding your personal effective range and also understand that a lot happens when adrenaline's involved in the moment of truth. So what you do in a controlled environment at the shooting range is probably not what you're going to do if you're throwing a backpack on the ground and a rifle over a backpack and shooting some weird 30 degree angle down through an elk that's moving through quickly. It's not like, you know, it's going to be different. And then know that Mother Nature just doesn't give an F about you. You're going to affect effectively get rained on snowed on it's going to be cold you're going to be hot um you're not going to be comfortable and it's going to be awesome because you are comfortable most of the time this is good for your mental but yeah i mean there's a it's a big deal and you would need uh several months of planning and preparation um before you make a decision hey everybody just want to interrupt the episode really quick and let you know that tomorrow uh, march 20th depending on when you're tuning in uh, we are launching our spring virtual warehouse sale. Uh, we do two of these a year. We'll do another one in the fall. Uh, but this is our biggest sale of the year. Um, there's a ton of items that have recently been added to it that are best sellers. Uh, we're making room, obviously, for spring inventory. So take full advantage of that. Head to bornprinter.com. It will end at midnight Pacific on Sunday night. Yeah, and to zoom in a little bit on something you you just said is, your personality and of course we we know you we, like you're you're a part of our brand here the born primitive outdoor brand it you're somebody and and i think bear and, and myself it like we we do this as well where you like to lean into hard shit. when you're when it, you're out in the field was that something right away let's i think you said your first elk hunt was when you were 21. when you had moments of i'm sure like being in the back country like that's a different level like that's not doing a, a an hour-long workout that's just really hard and pushing yourself there like there's the, like your life could be on the line out there if you start making mistakes and, and compiling on top of those. So I guess the question for me is, was that something right away that you you were able to lean into when you're in the field? Or did it take you developing a skill set for you to have the confidence to go in on a five day or a 10 day uh, loadout backcountry hunt and have the confidence to do that in a way that you enjoyed and it wasn't just breaking you down? Because you do hear horror stories of people that just are not ready for it at all they get out there in day two or day three, their bodies are broken down and mentally they've broke already. So do you have any personal stories when you were first starting or were you such a good, were you so good at prepping going into there and you had the right mindset that that was something you never really ran into? Yeah, no, I definitely didn't know what I didn't know, man. And uh, after my first year of elk hunting with the rifle and having success pretty fast, picking up a bow was like the polar opposite experience where uh i just didn't know a damn thing but i guess a story would be like this man i'm 22 i got a bow in hand i'm in north idaho and my uncle takes me out i begged him and i knew he was an archer elk hunter and i'm like hey man i killed him with the rifle i really want to take out take on this bow hunting deal 
he brings me to North Idaho. We go do, I think like a three day weekend hunt. I hear my first bugles. I get my teeth kicked in. He leads and I literally had the entire month to elk hunt by myself. And man, I didn't know I was afraid of the dark, to be honest with you. I didn't understand that until uh, he left. And I'm just, here I am by myself, solo in the back country, sleeping in a tent by myself. And then I got to get up in the dark at 4 a.m., get my shit together and go pump a hill in the dark so I can be on top when it's getting daylight. Like I didn't know that I like I was concerned about mountain lions and wolves and bears until it, I got there. And um laughing looking back, man, like uh I'm so thankful for that opportunity because I I still don't love the dark as a 42 year old, but I'm certainly not afraid of it. Like that is part that is do like I do business in the dark. That is what that is what being an elk hunter is. Is I don't ever see my truck in the daylight or my camp. I'm up before light. I'm hiking two hours before it's light to get where I need to be. I'm hunting all day. And then when it's time to head back to base camp, spike camp, or if I'm baby hunting, I get back with a headlight and I turn it on, make my dinner, go to bed. So as an elk hunter, man, I never see daylight unless I'm actually hunting. Whereas a lot of people think, I, a lot of you people listening right now think you're not afraid of the dark, and I know better. <laughs> you would be absolutely fearful, but my desire to kill an elk basically crushed any fear because if I was going to have success, I had to overcome that. And uh, man, I'm very thankful for it. Yeah, I love that. And I think th those are the experiences and l unless you're doing it, it's hard as you just called out our audience on it's, it's hard. To, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to know how you're going to react until you put yourself through it. So ha have you ever have you ever had any uh, close encounters with anything in your 20 years hunting? Absolutely. So be, after I killed that elk, I, uh, I was still 21. And I booked a hunt to Alaska. And uh, I did a drop off caribou hunt solo at age 21. Looking back, that was pretty dumb. No sat phone, nothing. Pilot drops me off in the middle of the Arctic circle and I'm caribou bow hunting. Uh, and I got one radio and it only works when the plane flies over. And uh, I mean, it took me a couple of days, a couple of grizzly encounters and I'm like interior grizz. And I'm like, what am I, what have I done? Like I was overconfident, which is kind of a blessing and a curse, but just looking back, how many people at age 21 are by themselves in the Arctic circle, chasing caribou and seeing moose and interior grizz. And, and eventually on that trip, I went fishing. I, I did kill a caribou pilot picked me up. He relocated me so I could just fish the rest of the trip uh, for silver salmon as they're running. And I'm sleeping on a tent that's on a beach in the middle of nowhere, Northern Alaska. And it's like, you look in the sand and there's all these prints in the sand as far as you can see. They're not human footprints. It's nothing but uh, coastal brown bear prints in the sand. And here I am sleeping next to them, waking up fishing next to them and uh, pretty hair raising experience, man. But yeah, as a as a guy who's hunted for 24 years in the, in the lower 48, I've seen double digit cougar in, encounters in real life, which is always fun. Uh, I've seen double digit wolf encounters, especially in Idaho. Um, I've, I, nature is wild. You guys follow that account on Instagram, nature is metal. metal. Yeah. It, it is metal, yeah. like it's for real. And, and where did that, like you just said, what other 21 year old gets dropped off in Alaska to do a, a backcountry caribou hunt? Where did that come from in you, Dan? Like, where is it something about how you grew up as a child? Is it something you think you were just born with? Where does that desire, not only for exploration, but then the drive to actually execute it come from? I think I just got a taste of it, you know, and just enough, just kind of like a hit, a little bump of wilderness and, and, and feeling alive and feeling scared all at the same time. Uh, my dad took me hunting when I was little, but uh, I got hunter safety test when I was 10, rifle hunted a little bit. And then as soon as sports hit, as you guys know, in junior high and high school, like hunting no longer was on the radar. So I didn't hunt at all from age 13 to 19. It was all about baseball, football, wrestling. But 
the seed was planted. I had a lot of good experiences with my dad, just being, me and him in the mountains. I don't remember the animals or anything. I just remember being with him and enjoying our time and loving being outside. So much so that when I was 19 and I graduated high school and I was a freshman in college, I'm like, I don't have practice. I, I could hunt again. I'm hunting again. And so that's, I, I, I give my dad all the credit in the world for just not forcing on me, but just allowing me to go tag along enough to really just invigorate me to where I'm so passionate about being anywhere, any wild landscape. I'm a happy guy if I can just be outside. I think part of the where you get hooked it has to be hardwired. Like it's it's an innate thing we all have, um, and hey, that's kind of the root of the name, born primitive, the brand, right? Um, so I think you're merely just tapping into you know an instinct we already have. And we had another guest named Michael Easter on here, and he's a like a best selling author, and he kind of has studied all of this. And one of the kind of takeaways he had was that you know spending time in nature has just crazy, crazy benefits to just our mental health. And I'm sure you've been able to experience it. You probably come out of the field one exhausted but probably also euphoric in you know just like your your calm anxiety's gone away you know what i mean you're relaxed um and i think for for most of us that are stuck in the hamster wheel like we have to make more of an effort to try to get in nature even if you're not going to go hunting you know go rent you know go to some national park and hang you know sleep in a tent for three days and be by yourself and or your significant other whatever but it's so cool you've been able to experience you, you got hooked early because I would imagine like for the last 20 years of your life, that has, you know, whether you've realized it or not, crazy uh, positive benefits to your mental health. And it, of course, having a passion and a hobby is so critical. I think especially for men, once we get out of playing sports or if you leave a military unit and you know what I mean, you need something to fill that void, um, you know, when you still have that beast inside of you. So, you know, you being dropped off in Alaska in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean, it's wild, but it's awesome. Um, and it, this is all new to me too. Like the fact that like, I, I didn't realize the success rate was so low, particularly again, cause we're spoiled. Cause we're working with like dudes like you and Aaron, right? Like Aaron is just like an absolute savage. Um, you know, I had my buddy, he was in Colorado for two weeks. Um, one of my military teammates and he was in the field for 15 days and I just assumed he would have got a, a bull, right? And he was like, oh, no. I, he's like, I, I think he only saw like a couple from like really far away. And I'm like, wait a second. You were just by yourself in the field for 15 days and you saw like two bulls like the whole time? Yeah. And he's like, no, dude, that's that's kind of how it is. And that, that's just wild to me because yeah. um, I didn't know that. I just figured like, you know, you, you get in there and, you know, you just kind of use some dead space and stalk up and like eventually you're going to find one. But that is obviously wow. far from the case. Uh, so, so mad respect, man. And it's, that's awesome. I mean, I can imagine you just being on a beach in a one man tent or a baby sack and you got grizzly prints like all around you, like uh, absolutely wild. You didn't even have a sat phone, You're like <laughs> maniac, dude. <laughs> yeah. Dan, walk us through, like, I would love to hear, and I'm sure it's changed because you're, you're 24 years into this, but you just described kind of the dark of the, the, the eye awakening experience of like, oh shit, like I'm about to, I'm waking up, I'm sleeping here and I'm about to hike in the, the pitch dark in the middle of nowhere. Can you broaden that a little bit? And you could do whether when you started to now, because I'm sure it has changed to kind of the range of emotions. Let's say on like a two week backcountry hunt that you feel, because I'm sure there's moments of feeling extremely connected to nature, but then is there a loneliness even in that short two week period that sets in? And can you kind of talk through how you navigate that and, and what that range actually looks like for you? Yeah, okay, let's do that. Um, one thing you said, Bear, was like, yeah, like in September, that's like my Super Bowl. That's when I go elk hunting. And I'm gone. Like last year, I literally was never home in September. And I have a family. I have kids and and a amazing family. And, and it's hard. And I'll get into that. But when I show up October 1st, I haven't seen my kids in a month, my wife. I am physically depleted. Like um, I lose... 15 pounds uh and i don't have 15 pounds to lose and <laughs> i am just completely depleted yet i am the fullest i've ever been i have been completely disconnected from my cell phone and notifications from emails and business and socials none of that for 30 days and it's like a restoration of balance uh and there is clarity like significant clarity that I want for everyone, however they get it. I want them to have a little bit of that. If I could bottle up that and distribute it because um, that's why I love 
September more than anything is the connection with the creator and a disconnection from the world. And I, I want that for everybody. And it's getting more elusive for all of us as these smart devices seem to own us and follow us everywhere we go. So getting this thing out of your life and thinking and pondering what really matters, because like to bring it back to your question, Tony, like, you don't elk hunt 24 hours a day on a 10 day hunt. Like you hunt when it's legal shooting light and there's more dark hours than there are daylight hours. So you're by yourself in a bivy or in a tent in the middle of nowhere to your own thoughts. And to be honest, you're not thinking about what am I going to do tomorrow? How am I going to kill that elk? That's a part of it. Maybe while you're eating dinner. But when you're by yourself, which is I primarily hunt solo, <laughs> this is the time for reflection. And this is the time to think about what like your gift of life and, and where you're kind of falling short and what changes you need to make to be a better man, to be a better husband, a better father, uh, a better leader at, of your business or your home. So like, dude, there's so much more value to hunting than just getting that elk meat back to the freezer. It's like it's a complete reset. And I will say the last part, which is maybe, maybe, maybe a little too truthful is like when you're by yourself and if you have any skeletons in the closet, man, if you've done some shit, you're not proud of, don't think that stuff's not going to come up to in reflection. Like you're going to really get a good look at the, your trajectory. And then you maybe have an opportunity to readjust that course just because you had that time to reflect. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's it, it's like guys like you have have hacked what we all should be doing, right? Like that's it, it, it kind of gave me chills thinking about it because there is so much reflection. I remember like we were up in Alaska doing some training, and you know we we would we were doing kind of survival stuff, so we had to keep a fire going, and you you would draw like a four hour fire watch in the middle of the night. I remember just sitting there. It's two o'clock in the morning. Everyone else is trying to sleep in this little structure we made, and I'm on fire watch, just staring at this fire. We're, you know, on some island in Kodiak, Alaska, uh, and you have literally four hours just to sit there and you're just hearing the crackle and pop and you, you hear everything around you and that you go back to those thoughts. You start reflecting on your life up to that point. And it's so cool, man. Um, and the fact that you're able to do that for a month. And for me, I'm fascinated because I haven't been able to figure this out on a personal level, you know, and, and you are an entrepreneur and you have started your own business. So to me, it's fascinating that you're able to shut it all down for a month, one with the business, right? So you, you must set it up in a way where it's like, all right, I'm out for a month. You know, I've, I've kind of given my marching orders and it's going to run on autopilot. Um, but also to the balance and expectation with your family where they know, I'm assuming they now understand how passionate you are about it. Um, and they give you the grace to go do that. And, and, and we've talked about this in some podcasts before of how critical it is to kind of fill your own cup because then you're a better version for those around you once you fill your cup up, right? And if you're always giving, 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 and you're never doing things for yourself, you eventually might become, you know, someone that's a bit resentful and, and bitter. Um, and particularly with the busy parents, um, you know, talking to the, especially the, the single parents out there, the ones that they got four kids running around and they, they literally never able to do anything for themselves because they're always taking their kids to practice and this and that. I think there's an argument to be made that sometimes you have to be a bit selfish um, because on the back end, it'll actually make you, um, you know, better for those around you. And, and, you know, maybe I'm misconstruing that, but I would imagine that's a conscious thing that happens with you and your family. And then when you come back, you're like, all right, dad's good for a while. He got his fill. Now it's family time. I'm present, um, but kind of coming back reinvigorated. And um, so, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm jealous, man. You get, you get to be out there that long, but, but can you elaborate on that a little bit? Am, am I, am I in the, in the ballpark of kind of how you've been able to balance that all with the business and in the family and all that? Yeah. Well, I'll just keep it real. Um, I, I'm not very good at balancing anything. Uh, it's kind of like a all or none. I really meant that. Like, and so that is a struggle and it always will be, but I am conscious, uh, conscientious about it. And so some best practices that I've learned through the hard way, through making the mistakes, uh, I've been married for 15 years coming up this year. And, uh, I needed to figure out what Alicia's version of elk, that's my wife, her version of elk hunting, like, what is it that makes her tick? What is she, what gets her excited? And if you've listened to my podcast, I've brought it up many times, but like HGTV, home and garden television, like 
Dude, Shiplap is my wife's middle name. She gets stoked about making things cool and pretty and home decor and landscape. And honestly, none of that shit interests me at all, to be honest with you. I'd rather be shooting my bow or working out. <laughs> but I have learned through the hard way to show her interest, show her interest, ask her questions, and really try to understand why, like, what makes her tick and why she's so passionate about that. Balance of family is another thing where I have made – some significant changes to what I do when it's not elk hunting season. Um, like I used to shed hunt for elk, elk drop their antlers every year and grow bigger ones. And so I would spend months in the hills just chasing, like hiking and picking up Easter eggs, man, brown gold. I don't do that anymore because that detracts from family time. Um, I don't do a lot of scouting trips in the summer where I'm going to go elk hunting. I don't go get boots on the ground because that takes away from family time. Summers are more like it's their calendar. What do you guys want to do? It's about you guys. And so I equate it to like um, an account where I need to make significant deposits into their accounts because I'm going to make significant withdrawals in September. But absolutely, your spouse has to understand that the byproduct of you going and chasing elk hunting for 10 days, two weeks, a month, like this psycho guy is that when I come out of the woods, that there's a better version of Dan. And I will be the first one to admit if I came out of the woods and was a shittier version of myself, I would not get the green light to elk hunt. So they they do see the change. They do see the the difference in, in my vibe when I get home and it's a healthy one. So uh, to recap, discover their version of elk hunting, what's their passion, and then constantly balance the equation by depositing intentionally year round. Yeah. I think the, the word that I think you used is you used it in the, about five minutes ago is reset. And I think that's something as, as technology has become more and more integrated with our everyday lives that we've lost touch with is like events. And, and you can, there, there's, there's so many different avenues to do that. You're you're talking about hunting. There's even doing a four day water fast. Like you will meet some demons within you that you didn't know you had because you're clearing out all the bullshit. Like personally, for for 12 years now, I've I've used psychedelics in a way that was was to shed an outdated version of myself. And I know people kind of have mixed feelings there, but I can speak firsthand that like you will go meet those demons that you've locked away in your closet, and you be better be ready to face them. And it's so scary when you do it, or in your case, just like a grueling experience as you do it. But then it, that that refreshing moment, what you said this earlier, if you could put that into a pill, that moment where you reemerge. And of course, there's religious context to this too, that like when you reemerge, it's like the Phoenix, like you, you that, that feeling and that connectedness that you bring to the table, then after you kind of shed the outdated version of yourself for something uh, like a software update, if you could put that in a pill, you'd be a billionaire because it is it is such a, a a difference than the kind of neurotic like hamster wheel mind that we have when you're on your phone all day. And I'm speaking about myself here. You're answering emails all day. Then you watch an hour long show at night like that feeling compared to that reconnectedness you feel when you put yourself through some type of initiation. It's night and day difference. So, yeah, it's me getting in in, in kind of my soapbox, just saying that, like, I think us as humans reconnecting with ways and, and each individual has their own way to do this. Um, but reconnecting with ways to reset and kind of hit the restart button from the normal neurotic day that you have is so, so valuable. And yeah, I think another kind of theme I want to extract from what you said, Dan, and I think this is so critical and, and I experience this, uh, uh, you know, on a personal level as well as I think for those of us, you know, you know, that are married, I'm not, but you know, hopefully eventually we'll be again. Um, I, I think it's critical. You have to let your spouse follow their passions, right? You have to now, obviously within reason. And I think you've set good boundaries to that, um, and done it in a really smart way. That doesn't mean, Oh, I love hunting. So I can just be gone all year chasing my passion. There is, of course it needs to be balanced to it, but I've seen situations where that doesn't happen. Um, and I don't think that's sustainable in a relationship. And I think it builds to a lot of resentment. So whatever she wants to go do, or he wants to go do, like you have to embrace that. And I think, you know, early on in the relationship, there needs to be that acknowledgement. Right. Um, and it, you, you got to know, you know, you're on the same page and, you know, I experienced that, you know, going into the military, you know, Mal and I were married and I kind of was like, Hey, like, I have to go do this crazy dream that I've been thinking about since 9-11, 
you know, I felt guilty that there were grown men my my age that were fighting on my behalf overseas, and I'm sitting in an air conditioned house in Indiana, living a really easy life. And I ultimately had to be like, hey, like, take 24 hours, but like, I'm doing this. I know our families, neither of us, them want me to do it, and it's dangerous, and I'm going to be gone a lot, and I know it's going to put stress on the marriage, but like, I just have to fucking do it. Um, and you know, ultimately, we made that joint decision, like, okay, that, that we're doing this thing, right? Um, but it was a hard conversation. Um, and ultimately no, we're not together anymore. And you could argue that a lot of me, you know, me being on 300 days out of the year while also running a business with her together, you know, had its, um, you know, had its effects and not say it was the right decision, but at least we were on the same page of like, all right, you maniac, if you're going to go do this, like I support you. And I think it's so cool that you get that, that, that kind of free pass to go do that. Um, of course with parameters. And I just think it's a good lesson. Um, cause I know I've learned that now that like, you know, when I become married again, whatever their passion is, like I'm all in on supporting that because I've been on the other side of it. I know how critical it is. Um, even when you have to sacrifice, like maybe you got to hold it down at the house for a month or they got to do their business trips or whatever it is they're chasing. You got to let them do it. Um, 100%. so yeah, I don't know. Uh, if you got any additional comments on that, Dan, and then I was going to shift to a little, little bit of business talk, but. No, you guys both bring up some great points. I, I think, uh, reflection is healthy. Like I, I got to agree with you, Tony, no matter how you try to go at it. Uh, but we, it is a tough deal in this world to pause, to find a place to pause and be still. Um, uh, and I, I know, I know the best practices that I get out of the good word is. There was a guy who would definitely separate himself, go to the highest place and just be, be still, be quiet. And I know that that's in our DNA. We need that. And then setting a precedent, like you said, Bear, like initially with my wife, I dated her. I was at that point filming hunts for a living, running a gym and hunting myself. And I know our first year of dating I was gone, not 300 days, but like during from September to the end of November, I think I might've been home maybe a day or two while we were dating. And so don't pull any punches. If you have a candidate to marry, you know, be who you are, because the last thing you want to do is get married and then, okay, now we're married. I want to change you. That will not work. Like, uh, and so that was a beautiful thing about my wife was that she's never wanted to change me. She knew what she was getting. I didn't, I, I didn't put out a facade. I wasn't fronting just to impress her. I was a mountain man and, uh, that's what she was getting. And, and, uh, that's, that's really important. And I, I encourage the young, the younger guys and gals listening to before they go down that road is, you know, set a precedent. Yeah. We always had the rule, um, you know, in our community that if you meet a girl, go through one deployment and training cycle together to make sure they're cut out for that. Um, you know, and, and if they're good to go when you get back, then she's probably a keeper. But if she's like, you know, who is this maniac? He's gone, you know, every month run around the woods, shooting bell fed machine guns and, you know, jumping out of planes and stuff. And then you gone for six months on deployment. It's a lot of times that shows real quick. Um, so I totally agree. You gotta be, you gotta be you. And, uh, if that's you, um, you know, don't don't hide it because it'll it'll come out in the wash eventually. Um, well, real quick on on business, Dan, and then we'll wrap up. You know, obviously we've talked about a bunch of other stuff, but behind all this, really successful business, and you know, Tony, you kind of threw a softball of like, how does one get prepped? But you know, obviously for for guys or girls that are aspiring to get into this, or if they're already in it, but just to get better and level up the elk shape app provides all of that. I mean, I know you have programming, you've got gear guides and everything. So just for the, you know, obviously kind of free plug here, but I think it's very interesting. Um, just explain to the viewers, the elk shape program and, and kind of what it solves for and how they can, you know, kind of get signed up for it. Oh, wow. Dude, that is a softball. Uh, <laughs> there it is. Don't miss. <laughs> Look, I'd be honest. I, I don't really care what anybody does for their workouts. As long as they're consistent, I feel like, you guys would probably agree. Like all we want for everyone is continuity when it comes to taking care of themselves, making time for themselves. And it starts with like doing hard things, uh, doing challenging things and, and fighting off the ravages of aging. Aging's the thing, right? So um, we have an elk shape training program that is basically tailored to those that want to get ready for their outdoor goals. 
Ours is just happens to be elk hunting, but it really doesn't matter what your goal is if you want to get outside. So we just do a year round seasonality programming that is paradise to build you up to tackle the mountains. And we'd be lying if we didn't say we were deeply rooted into functional fitness, CrossFit style of training. Uh, but we still integrate, you know, energy system development, rucking and um, just doing hard things and very little minimal equipment because it just doesn't take much to get results if you're consistent. So we started that and uh, we've been doing that for a couple of years now where we just have an online program, a nice little community of like-minded people that train at home largely. Some people go to a gym, but most of them can just do the workouts. And, and uh, honestly, just we're trying to sell hard work. We want to find the best version of you. Uh, and that's really exciting when you can sell hard work. Cause that is something that not everybody wants to buy. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's also guidance on gear and stuff like that. Right. Cause obviously, you know, that's can be a critical component, especially for extended field stay. If you get the wrong gear, you're, you're in a world of hurt. Yeah. For, so for my business, man, honestly, one thing we didn't mention is that like, I am obsessed with YouTube. Like I've had a YouTube channel for 11 years and I am like consistent on putting out free content there because I feel like that is the medium that you can really go long form, educate, inspire, maybe even entertain a little. Um, and yeah, gears covered for sure. We have a couple of different YouTube channels, but like YouTube is takes up a lot of my energy. I'm obsessed with it. And I just love that medium where you can sit back, watch it on your phone or TV and learn. And honestly, guys, there wasn't much of a YouTube channel um, or internet for that matter. When I started elk hunting, there wasn't podcasts. There wasn't so much information at my fingertips. I had to go, um, not to sound old, but man, I do think there's just more awesome information and platforms out there for people to learn faster than say maybe how I did when I started. So yeah, like I'm excited about educating people and getting them the information they need to have success. Yeah. And just to kind of throw a quick BP outdoor plug in there, you know, part of the roots of us launching born primitive outdoor was from my military experience. You know, I got trained on kind of a layering system. And if you're out, you know, in wet Alaska for four days, you know, and you're not coming back to the, you know, the, the, the compound, like what to, how to, how to layer, you know, what to wear, what, how to pack your ruck, all that stuff. I got exposed to that. Um, and obviously getting into the Western hunting scene, it's very similar, right? You're out there for sometimes, you know, weeks at a time and your gear is so critical and, and, you know, particularly the clothing. Um, so everything we've built for born Primitive outdoor is a layering system, obviously starting with your next to skin layer, then you got your mid layers, your outer layers, and then we're launching our rain gear soon. Um, but, uh, you know, it, we've all been in a situation or, uh, you know, I'm sure you have Dan, I know I have where you're, you're in the elements and you don't have the appropriate gear and you learn the hard way and you say, man, I'm never going to make that mistake again. And that's kind of the, you know, the motivation, but behind, you know, the apparel we launched in born primitive outdoor is, you know, for that extended field stay, you know, the base layers, obviously get, you got Merino wool built in. So the, you know, moisture wicking antimicrobial, so you don't stink after 10 days, uh, mid layers. It's, it's all meant to create pull moisture from the, from the, you know, the, the, you know, the skin layer all the way out. So if you do get a little wet, hey, if you're rucking up a mountainside, that body heat will generate almost a you know an ecosystem in the layering system to pull that moisture out. If your socks are wet, you can throw them in your pocket in your puff jacket. By the time you get to camp, your socks are dry. You know that night, everything is thought through. So it's cool to see you know guys like you and Aaron that have now taken it that are that are real real hunters that are out there in the elements. You're not doing some weekend hunt. Uh, on some closed ranch. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, for the, for the viewers that are wondering, Hey, why did born, like, what's the inspiration behind born primitive outdoor and why are they in the Western hunting scene? And, and you know, that's kind of the, the root of it. Um, and you know, Dan, I know you're going to be, you know, integral part of it, but we got a lot, a lot of new gear coming. That's even better, but we appreciate you got you repping it, man. And hopefully it's, it's, it's held up, you know, to the task of you, you know, beating the crap out of it, uh, out on the mountains. Yeah, like the the form, the fit, the function. Uh, like I'm pretty snobby when it comes to what I wear when I'm hunting, and I feel like a lot of manufacturers have fallen short to, like they've made like these kind of one size fits all. Where like when I put your guys' stuff on, I feel like a, I feel like an athlete because I am an athlete, man. I'm in the mountains performing, 
And the last thing I want is something that doesn't fit right. And uh, getting wet and getting cold, they go hand in hand. And I, I despise being cold. I'm a low body fat guy. I struggle to stay warm in the mountains. So getting wet just from sweat or, you know, rain, perspiration, all that kind of stuff, condensation is like an enemy of mine. And so your guys' gear has been so damn technical. And uh, like that's why I wanted to work with you guys, just because I feel like um, there's just a lot of fluff out there and in a space where we are asking for the top materials, the right stitches to be in place so that we don't have to think about anything else other than the task at hand, which is getting it done and as we found out in this today's pod, it's just not easy. And it's the odds are against you already. The last thing you want to worry about is clothing. So clothing is gear, man. Like this is gear. This is stuff I take serious. Uh, I feel like my livelihood depends on what you guys make and the quality. And um, it's been an honor. And I just love your roots. Uh, and that, I mean, I've known about you guys since 2013. So I'm stoked to have you guys in this outdoor space. Yeah, that's so wild that you knew about us in the beginning because I mean, dude, that was like that is OG days. I mean, that's that's me and Mal at a cart, you know, selling from a card table out of the Jeep, like no shit. Um, so that is so cool that it's come full circle, and um, I'm glad the gears work good. Have you? Are you tracking the the stretchy rain shell we have coming? I don't have it yet. All right. But well, I can't wait. I've been looking every time I walk by Nicole's desk, I see the prototypes and they're freaking awesome. So it's, it's basically a rain shell pant and jacket, but it stretches. Um, it's like a four way stretch. And that was like the inspiration behind that. And I hate to keep using Alaska as an example, but we had an exercise up there and we, it, it rained for like three and a half days straight. And we had like a field exercise. It was like our FTX, right. And they grade us, you got a land nav and you're in a little fire team and you do a bunch of stuff and they try to find you. It was really cool. But unfortunately it literally rained for like three days straight. So we had our shell on, you know, the, the entire time, your shell jacket and shell pants that we all packed. And, you know, uh, hopefully we figured we'd shed them at some point, but we never did. Cause I, I literally don't think it stopped raining once. Um, but we're rucking up and down these mountains where we, you know, we had to land that, I don't know, it was across maybe 10 or 12 miles, but rough terrain, the brush was above your head. It was just insane. We had machetes. It was horrible. Um, but we were going up these mountains with an 80 pound pack on and I couldn't lift my legs up because the, the, the shell didn't stretch, right? It was just a very kind of vanilla shell pant. There were no pockets on the outside. You know what I mean? And same thing with the jacket. And after the fourth day, I remember that planted a seed of like, we have to find a version of this that stretches out. Now that was like 20, like, I don't know, 2017. That was a long time ago. Um, but, you know, once we did research and we found that you can have a shell that, you know, I figured I, it wasn't physically possible. Like if it stretches, how does it block moisture? But it, it does. So again, it gets back to your point. Everything we've made fit and function is so critical, um, particularly fit for an athletic build, right? Um, so when you get your hands on it, man, it, it's freaking awesome. I got to, you know, put the pants and jacket on the other day. Um, and we're really stoked on it. And I know Aaron's tried it out and hey, you know, he's kind of given the, the blessing as well. So stand by for that. Uh, I think it's, I think it will finally make the layering system complete. Obviously you can't have a full layering loadout without the shell. Um, and that's the one component we've been missing, but it's, we didn't want to screw it up. Right. So we, 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 we slow played it cause that's such a critical component of your gear and it's super expensive, right? You know, it's like, I don't know, $90 a yard or something. It's wildly uh, pricey. So, uh, but it's, it'll be worth the wait, man. We'll obviously make sure we get you squared away once it's done. I think, what do we think, Tony, August? No, no, we're, we're earlier than oh, that. Oh, awesome. It, yeah, we're looking at a, a potentially like mid to late May. I, I would say, to be realistic, early June. Kurt, oh, Kurt and I were just talking just about in time. yesterday. So, and what are we yeah. calling it? The Mount Rainier rain shell yeah i think that's and then what's the 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 barrier jacket as well is the barrier jackets a new kind of like wind blocking like rain water resistant not waterproof check that yeah that jacket you'll get here soon too dan yeah well well, i'll I'll stop plugging sorry (laughs) (laughs) had had to sneak that in there but uh but tony you got anything else for dan no no i was just gonna say stoked to have you part of the brand i know kurt has nothing but good things to say about his interactions and kind of your proactiveness as far as just always being willing to to do whatever for the for the brand so love to have you a part of it and it was great great to have an hour to to kind of shoot the shit to get to know you a little better it was an honor fellas appreciate your time 
All right, Dan. Well, hey, I'll see you out at Western Hunt next week. I'm looking forward to chatting there. Um, and, and thanks for repping us, dude, and, and great conversation. I, I think beyond just the hunting, I think there was some life shit we can pull from that. And that's the goal, you know, in these. We, we like to kind of, uh, you know, widen the scope a little bit. So hopefully you all got something out of that. And I uh, really appreciate your time, Dan. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Dan. Later.